Now we'll look at how neighbours fail. When neighbours fail, or a link to them does, this changes how traffic flows through the network. We can broadly consider three possibilities. When the OSPF process is shut down or fails. When the interface the neighbour is on goes down, this could be deliberate or accidental. And when hello messages go missing. Usually, when the OSPF process shuts down, it's deliberate. We want to shut it down for some reason. We can do this with the shutdown command under OSPF configuration. We may need to do this in a case where we want to do maintenance on the router and don't want it advertising routes for a while. Although rare, it's also possible that the OSPF process could crash. If this happens, you should really log a ticket with Cisco to find out what went wrong. And of course, rebooting the router will also cause the OSPF process to stop. Interfaces going down is a different story. This could happen when we shut down an interface or when a link fails. Imagine a case like this one, where a router connects directly to another and an OSPF adjacency is up. Now imagine that this link were to fail for some reason. Maybe someone's cut the cable or disconnected it from either router. What would the result be? It's an easy question to answer, isn't it? The interfaces on both routers would go down. Both routers would immediately know that this neighbor is gone. This results in the loss of the neighbor adjacency. OSPF would need to reconverge and find alternate paths through the network if they exist. What if the two routers aren't directly connected? Consider this example. These two routers are neighbors, but they connect through a switch. What happens in this case if a link were to fail? The top router would detect this failure immediately as its interface will go down. It will respond by tearing down its neighbor relationship. The bottom router though will behave differently. It won't immediately detect that the link has failed as the link between itself and the switch is still up. It would be the same if the top router died or rebooted. The bottom router wouldn't immediately know that something is wrong. This could present a problem. If a router thinks there's a valid path when there isn't, it could forward traffic off to its doom. So this router needs to learn the change in the network so it can adapt. You may have guessed the solution here. Remember how neighbors continually send each other hello messages? The main point of hellos, as we already know, is to form adjacencies with neighboring routers. But they have another purpose. These continual hello messages show that a neighbor router is up. If the hello messages go missing for too long, one router will know that the other router is unreachable. It will then adapt as needed. By default, routers send hello messages every 10 or 30 seconds, depending on the network type. I'll explain network types in the next video. This is known as the hello interval or hello timer. OSPF routers also have a dead timer. The default dead timer is four times the hello interval. So that means that the dead timer is 40 or 120 seconds, depending on the network type. If a router does not see a hello message from its neighbor for the duration of the dead timer, it will assume the neighbor is down. So in the example shown here, the bottom router would expect to see hello messages every 10 seconds. When it hasn't seen any hello messages in 40 seconds, it decides that the neighboring router is down. It is then able to adapt and find other paths through the network, assuming other paths exist, of course. Can you see any problems with this? The problem is that routers are slow to detect some failures. In our example, it takes 40 seconds for the router to even know that something is wrong, let alone adapt to it. That's not great in a modern network. Can you imagine if users are on Teams or Zoom meetings and a link fails? It could be a full minute before they recover. Meanwhile, they're all wondering what's going on. If the routers could recover quicker, the users would only notice a small blip in their meetings. That they think, oh, that's odd, and then they'd move on with their day. Remember that OSPF is quite old. Zoom and Teams didn't exist back then. That doesn't mean that we can't improve things, though. In fact, the way to improve this is to tune the timers. Let's try this out now. We do this using OSPF configuration under each interface. That means we can have different timers per interface if we want to. Let's change the hello interval to one second with the 
IP OSPF hollow interval command. The same principle is true for the dead interval. We'll set that to 4 seconds with the IP OSPF dead interval command. I've sped the video up a bit here, but as you can see, this causes the neighbor adjacency to fail. Let's make the same changes on the neighboring router. The configuration is identical to before. The neighbor relationship also comes back as a result. And that's one way of improving OSPF's performance. You can use this principle with other routing protocols too. There are often pros and cons when we tune our network. It's good to try to find the right balance and set the right values. And finally, we have the lab. Part one is configuring the topology as shown. This includes configuring a loopback, which provides the router ID, configuring peering between all routers, advertising the three connected networks and the loopback IP, and finally, verifying that it's all working. To make it more fun, on R1 and R2, you should use the network command with a wildcard mask. On R3 and R4, you should configure peering per interface. You can decide which of these two methods you like best. For part two, as usual, it's the same topology, but the network is broken. Neighbors aren't forming as they should be. Find the faults in the network and resolve them. So that's how OSPF neighbors form adjacencies. The next video looks at some more of OSPF's complexities. This includes network types, neighbor states, and the OSPF database. I hope to see you there.